female is know that neck of the woods. And um, I had my first job on a little country newspaper in the town of Wakery. Um, I used to fly gliders. Uh, Wakery is a big centre for, for the, the sport of gliding. Um, and those years were really formative for me. Um, and the landscape was really formative. One of my first memories of Australia, in fact, is, uh, is being at the top of the Adelaide Hills, looking over the plain, uh, which goes all the way to the Simpson Desert, ultimately. But the, the river in South Australia runs through that desert. So um, I was always very interested and attracted to that landscape. And gradually, as I grew up, became aware that it was changing quite rapidly, that the irrigation settlements of which Wakery was one were, were threatened by declining water quality. Mm. And in many ways, I think I've been writing about the river ever since. My first novel was set in the South Australian Riverland. Um, one of my other big books called um, The Meeting of the Waters was about the High Marsh Island affair. Hmm. which was a, an enormous controversy back in the early 90s, which took place at the mouth of the Murray River. Hmm. And I've written other, the last big thing I wrote on the Murray Darling was an essay about 10 years ago, when there was a lot of optimism about the Murray Darling Basin plan that was then just being devised. Hmm. And I've been aware that the wheels were falling off, that things were going wrong, but I wasn't really clear on why. So I embarked on this project partly to explain to myself what was going on, <laughs> but also because I thought it was such an important issue and I was well aware that most people aren't really across it because it is horrifically complex. Yeah, it is very much so. And there was, um, you do, uh, you do uh, sort of bring some history into your essay and say, um, and basically uh, let us know that this is not a recent conflict, that it has gone well back back in time to the 1890s. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, yes. So when um, Europeans were first spreading out across the continent, the river systems were mainly seen as being about uh, navigation rather than irrigation. So paddle steamers used to ply their way up and down the Murray and a long way up the Darling as well, which is hard to believe these days when it's dry more often than not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but um, around um, our second prime minister, before he was prime minister, Alfred Deacon really pioneered irrigation with the earliest irrigation settlements of Mildura and Renmark. He brought the Chafee brothers out from California who were mm. irrigation entrepreneurs. Um, and then at the time of federation, irrigation was still in its infancy, but it did feature. But our founding fathers, when they were tangling with each other over the constitution and whether or not they would form a federation, uh, water issues were some of the most hotly debated. The pages of debates go on forever. And in some ways, nothing changes. Um, they were constantly threatening to walk out, you know, to burn the constitution, lots of drama. And it's never really changed from that. The states and the Commonwealth have never really been able to agree either with each other or with the Commonwealth. Um, but ultimately, long story short, the decision was made then that the states would own and have responsibility for managing their own water, even in mm. shared rivers like the Murray. Uh, yeah. Victoria would own its water, the water that came from its tributaries, and New South Wales would own its. And then much later in the day, uh, irrigation began to develop in northern New South Wales and Queensland, and so those states then came into the picture as well. And it's been a battle ever since. Yeah, especially um, if you're if you are in your manage your water and you happen to be downstream, that's extremely problematic. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Well, the whole story, really. I mean, it's upstream hating on downstream, downstream hating on upstream, state hating on state, crop hating on crop. Yeah. It's um, you know nobody nobody agrees with anything. It's a it's a really bitter and divisive story about. Um, a water system which really connects us all in a in a literal sense. Yeah, and so I mean, since the eighteen nineties, there has been a lot of contesting and and sort of bitterness about um, rights and who has an, an interest and influence. But when did um, a sense of responsibility start to take hold for the actual river, for the health of the river? Well, I think it was becoming apparent in the eighties to some extent the 70s, but certainly into the 80s, that the water, by now, of course, the main story was about irrigation, irrigated agriculture. And it was becoming clear that the river had been over allocated. So Adelaide, which is my hometown, the water quality that we were drinking, 
was deteriorating really fast and that was a huge political issue. Mm. Um, salinity, the water was becoming increasingly saline in South Australia yeah. um, and the irrigators were having to deal with that. And then through the sort of late 80s into the 90s, we began to have those horrific outbreaks of blue-green algae, mm. which made swathes of the river literally toxic. Mm. Um, and there was an increasing sense um, that the river would die, killing the agriculture with it, unless something was done. But it moved very slowly. Um, there were various agreements between the states to try and address the issue, but it only really began to get together during the Howard government years with the um, um, work on what became the Water Act, which was passed in 2007. Mm. And there was a fair bit of bipartisanship. Labor basically continued the program that was um, started there. But mm. part of the problem, of course, is that the Commonwealth doesn't really have much power in this area. No. It can do very little without the agreement of the state. Right. Which is... So not a hell of a lot has changed, really, since the, those founding fathers. And I don't think there's any doubt that if you were, you know, if you were starting Australia today, modern Australia today, you would give power over water to the Commonwealth. But, um, you know, to, yeah. we all know how hard it is to change the Constitution. <laughs> we do. Mm. Um, in terms of before 2007 and the Water Act, can we just go a little bit back to the 80s and the 90s? So there was that understanding that the health of the rivers system was, mm. you know, in deep trouble. But it was also, you know, the time of, you know, free market. Um, mm. Let's let's give the, the market outcomes are the best outcomes. So yes. that was the time when water began to be traded. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So historically, and here I'm taking a very broad brush to great yeah. complexity. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, if you're an irrigator, you have a license to take water, and then a certain amount of water is allocated against that license every year. Mm. Um, and so you've got two things there, a fixed license and the allocation. But historically, the water was tied to the land. So mm. if you sold the land, you'd sell the water license and allocation with the land. Yeah. So yes, you're quite right, the era of economic rationalism, the Hawke Keating government, the idea came that one of the answers to the problems of the river was to allow water to be traded, mm. um, to separate it out from the land. And that took a while, long story short, but basically in, by the late 1990s, water had been largely unhitched from land, which means you could sell either your licence or just your year's allocation against that licence. And that could be traded downstream, which is pretty easy to understand, but also harder to understand upstream right <laughs> um, and this now has led to a situation where water is traded like any other commodity and in the current in the drought that is uh, hopefully in the process of ending now we've had allegations that water is being hoarded or or held by water barons um, in order to drive the price up so that they can sell it at, at a higher level and these allegations of water barons do these barons have faces? Do they have names? Um, they're companies rather than individuals. I mean, one of the things I say in the essay is I found all sorts of conspiracy theories about individuals. Mm. There are people in the basin who believe firmly that Eddie Maguire, of all people, um, owns all the water. <laughs> and another bunch of people who believe that um, Penny Wong, or alternatively her father, who's a Malaysian businessman, own all the water. More serious allegation against Penny Wong, of course, because she is a former water minister. Mm. Um, and I contacted Penny Wong and also Eddie Maguire has already gone public on it. There is no truth to those rumours at all, but they are firmly believed within the basin. But the water, the water, the big owners of water tend to be large agricultural businesses and also other commodities traders. So like Elders, uh, there's a company called Duxton's in South right. Australia. Um, you know, they're, they're the main people. It's not really um, single individuals. Um, mm -hmm. although, and lots of farmers, you know, irrigators who've retired from the business might well put some of their superannuation into owning water, you know, and just have it as an investment like any other, really. Right. Mm -hmm. And Penny Wong said herself to you that um, when, when there is no transparency, that's where conspiracy theories arise. Exactly. And that's very true. There is, it is impossible for a journalist or any other member of the public to find out who owns water. 
right. which is really, I mean, there's all sorts of historical reasons for that. Partly, again, it's the problems of our federal system. The states own that data and manage it. But, you, you know, you or I, as you would know, we can go and do a, a search and find out who owns real estate or who owns shares in a company. You mm. can't find out who owns water. Right. And a lot of people have identified that as a real problem. It's that lack of transparency that mm. causes the conspiracy theories to grow. And that's understandable. Very much so. And is and this is jumping ahead, but is transparency on the table? Is that something that people, um, the authority, are considering mm. quite seriously? A lot of people have highlighted, I'm not the first one to say that that's a problem. Um, yep. Nick Guilty, who has uh, got a, a sort of, who is the top cop of the basin, if you like, has identified that as an issue. But there is also pushback from irrigators saying that they uh, regard it as a breach of their privacy for um, that information to become available. So right. um, that we couldn't we couldn't say for sure that there will be more transparency, but certainly I'm not the only one calling for it. All right, that's interesting. So the Murray-Darling Basin Commission was formed around about the same time as the water trading really took off. That's right. Um, mm. And then there was the millennium drought, which yes. kind of brought everything to its knees. And I think most people who were you know, even teenagers in that time will remember that that drought. I, I remember vividly the, the desiccated corpses, the photos of corpses. Um, that was the time when states started building desalination plants and all that kind of thing. Can you describe um, what was, I mean, considering that you do have this great connection to this river system, do you have any really real vivid memories of the drought, of that particular drought? Yes, I do. I remember going back to Waikuri for a family wedding, um, just about in the middle of the drought. And um, I, I knew it was going to be bad. I was almost frightened to go back, given how you know deep that landscape goes for me. But it was terrible. It was just awful. The river was dying. There was just no doubt about it. Um, you know, billabongs and wetlands that I remembered, you know, as a child playing with and so on were just dead. The mm. town was dead, you know. The, the yeah. family member who was getting married, I remember, was leaving the town very shortly after that um, because there simply was no future there for him. Yeah. Um, fruit trees were being ploughed up and left to die. Mm. Um, it was it was terrible. And... Um, and, you know, this is one of the things that leads me to say in the end that we're probably better off with the, with the Murray-Darling Basin Plan than without it, because at mm -hmm. that stage, of course, there wasn't a plan. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, I was back in that, that country as I was researching this essay. It's, it was better even in the teeth of the current drought, which is another awful, awful drought. Mm. It was better than it was back at the Millennium Drought. And that is largely, I think, because of the plan. It's still pretty terrible. I'm not saying it's great yeah. by any means, but it was better than it was. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and that was the time when there was this, you know, there was a spate of uh, farmers uh, suiciding. It was like a devastating, devastating time. And mm. then the Water Act was passed with Turnbull leading that. Yeah. Um, and then the Rudd and government... Then Water Minister. Yeah. Yep, yep, that's right, that's right. Um, and then Rudd and, uh, got in, the Labor government. And can you talk a little bit about a, the pennies from heaven? Yes, yeah, sure. So, yes, so the Rudd government gets in. Penny Wong is made Water Minister and Climate Change Minister. I mean, just unbelievable that she got both those portfolios, if you think about it. <laughs> both of them incredibly difficult, complicated problems, and neither of them ended well. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> So she um, then has carriage of trying to implement the Water Act, which, and so there's a long process of trying to persuade the states to sign over their powers um, so it can be implemented. And the idea is that the Murray-Darling um, Basin Commission would become the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, and that its first job is to do a sort of audit of all the water in the basin, and through the best available science, work out how much water can be taken from the river Mm. irrigation in a sustainable fashion so that's percolating away for most of the period of the Rudd government um, meanwhile though Penny doesn't wait so she decides it's perfectly clear the water's over allocated it's perfectly clear that we're going to have to claw some water back from irrigation and she just goes straight into the market and starts buying it and this period is known throughout the basin as the pennies from heaven period 
and there's all sorts of different points of view about whether she bought the right water or whether she bought it for the right price. Uh, but she bought a lot of water. She bought more water than any minister has since. It was the main way. And she didn't wait for the plan. Right. And of course, that was controversial because the plan was meant to tell us, oh, where should we regain the water or whatever. But it's still the case that, you know, most of the water that has been recovered was recovered in that period and it was recovered simply by buying it. Now, lots of people will tell you it was devastating to particular communities. You take the water out of a community and, of course, the community shrinks, the schools close, you know, all the usual sorts of things. Mm. There have been various surveys of that. The Productivity Commission will say, yes, it has an impact, but it's not the main impact. Rural communities are under other strains and it wasn't mainly the water buybacks. Yeah. But when the change of government came and Barnaby Joyce became water minister, he put an end to the water buybacks, except for strategic water buybacks. Mm. And the system changed from one that, would, by and large, was a system of open tender. And the system changed to one with, again, very limited transparency. And a lot of people will be aware that there's been various controversies about how much was paid for water and to whom. Mm. Um, with, you know, very difficult to find out really what the decision making process was. Yes. Mm. Yes, yes, very well, well, well ended that sentence there with <laughs> a lot unsaid. <laughs> um, and so, again, back to the plan then. So, that Penny Wong did the pennies from heaven, and then the plan came out. Mm. Um, and it describes itself as being a world first um, this idea of having a plan between um, sort of trying to connect states and communities. Um, or with this idea that the water needs to be shared um, responsibly and also with, con you know, deep consideration of the river. Mm -hmm. um, but you do write about this, um, the dead language mm -hmm. of, this, of this particular plan, which I, which I loved. And you have this, there's this wonderful moment in the essay where Margaret um, screams out into some, a dry riverbed sustainable diversion limit adjustment mechanism <laughs> and shout it to the wind and you don't even impress the goats basically no. No. but this is the plan is is incredibly um yeah you're right the language is completely deadening which is mm. kind of horrifying because what we're trying it's trying to do is to save the soul of the river system mm. basically um and did you, do you find that sort of, and it reminded me of my own work when I looked at the abattoirs and there was a quote by George Batil, which was, in the eyes of a butcher, um, the horse is already dead. Mm. But the river is not like that. It has to be alive in order for everyone to draw favour from it. Mm. Um, yeah. And that's such a complicated resource as a result. Mm. Um, and you set out on this journey to basically, and I think in, in comparison to the dead language, you brought it to life. You've got this beautiful writing of these sort of fur balls of white on the side of the road. Um, even the prickly pear is wrinkled and, and facing downwards. Um, and yet you, just by doing that journey, you brought it, I think, to life um, in a way that the dead language cannot can you tell us about taking off on this journey like what did you what did yeah. it involve well a, a hell of a lot of driving <laughs> um, <laughs> so i did it in several bits i did one trip where i drove um from sydney um to the headwaters of the macquarie river and then to dubbo um and then down to the lachlan river um the area around forbes and parks um, uh, down to Hay and the Murrumbidgee, Griffith, um, and then into Victoria and home to Melbourne. Um, and then I did another trip from Adelaide and drove up to the border, basically, following the river all the way. Mm. Um, and then the big trip, um, I started in Mildura and drove right up to Darling, uh, which is very remote country, um, and ended in Brisbane, um, but drove, you know, right up the Darling and then 
um, turned right basically, <laughs> and um, and went through um, St George and uh, Dirrimbandi, Cotton Country, uh, Moree, Gundawindi, and then ultimately the Darling Downs. Yeah. So you know, a lot of big trips. I, I guess it was about five weeks of travel in all. Mm. And I loved that bit, you know, I, I loved that sort of travel in the Australian inland, but there were some very sad moments in it. But just to comment on that dead language thing, I mean, since irrigation took off, the water engineers have basically been the dominant narrative of the river. Mm. And, and it's engineering language, really, that you have mm. to, you know, engineering language mixed with bureaucratic language that you kind of have to fight at every point to really get to the heart of the story, I think. Yeah. Mm. And it, and I mean the d disconnect in so many ways. So one of the characters that you meet on these journeys was um, Scott Armstrong, a mm. cotton farmer in the Northern Basin, who is you know p p possibly for those downstream you know looked at as the enemy, mm. um, but he um, just seemed like such a uh, salt of the earth kind of character. Lovely guy. And, yeah. Yeah. And. Yeah. You have this wonderful quote from him where he said to you, once Australia was proud of people like me, and now the country and the city really don't understand each other. Which is profoundly true, I think. Um, you know, in Australia's, in the, in the white history of Australia, um, you know, we, we have all, you know, those Henry Lawson stories, who's very much a Murray Darling boy. <laughs> um, you know, the drover's wife who lived on a tributary of the Darling and um, Clancy is the overflow and the overflow is on the Lachlan River and virtually any other Banjo Patterson poem or Henry Lawson story you want to refer to will be a Murray Darling location. Yeah. Um, and our whole imagination was tied up with the country. That's probably how Australia would have identified itself. Now, obviously, just about everything about that has changed. Mm. But we now have this complete divide I think, between country and city, and mm. both sides are impoverished by that, and both sides have some pretty ugly stereotypes about the other. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, we won't solve the problem of the Murray-Darling Basin unless we get over that, which involves city people mm. getting a better understanding of how the food that they eat and the clothes that they wear are produced, mm. um, and country people perhaps getting over the idea that everybody who lives in the city is is some sort of um, soft-headed, soft-handed uh, <laughs> enemy. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And how and how to how to bridge that divide? Do you see journalism as as a way to? Um, do you see it as a failure of journalism? Yes, I do, and that's actually one of the motivations for doing the essay. I mean, one of the things you realise is not only do we have that fundamental divide between city and country between those who eat the food and those who produce it. But we have a divide even within the river system. So people in St George have got absolutely no idea about what the problems and priorities are in Renmark, and the reverse is also true. That's right. Everybody's basically doing what they can get away with or been allowed to get away with by governments mm. um, all the way along the river, but without any real understanding of how that affects other communities and other people. Mm. So you've got these, you know, the literal connection of the riverbed and the water when it's flowing, um, but no flow of information. Now that's a that's a failing of governments, but it's also in part a failing of journalism. I think, mm. and of rural journalism in particular. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. And I do, and I did notice that because um, you do write about how, you know, that this there is a uh, the toxicity of politics and um, that and the toxicity of the the conversation around the river system mm. and how it may bring the plan undone and yeah. how the, the the plan for all its flaws is potentially the only thing we've got well, and it's it, the only thing it's the only thing on the table and yeah. it's also not a fixed quantity yeah um, you know i think it is already clear that it's not adequate you know leaving aside implementation i don't think it's adequate we didn't know enough when it was devised. We still don't really know enough about where the water is and where it goes, and it will have to be changed. But as a framework, it's all we've got. You know, mm. we have to. You know, I, there are people in the Southern Basin who are running this can the plan protest. I don't even really know what that means. I mean, if you take the plan <laughs> away, it doesn't take away the problems of managing the river. You're still going to have to come up with a framework, and this is the framework. So it needs mm. to be made better. 
yeah definitely and it kind of reminds me of like the so the 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 neg the energy mechanism that was never actually put in place mm. um it gets it's, it's to that point where we're now at a situation where it doesn't really matter how flawed something is a mechanism needs to be put on the table yeah. in order for i guess the river system to be saved yeah. um and i do i found your essay is almost as if you were aware of um the, your responsibility of not making the debate any more toxic did mm. you feel that way did you feel that you had to restrain yourself um if you did have if you did have any anger you couldn't you had to control it or did you feel like you this is this is the way the journalism ought to be oh no i i mean i felt incredibly sad more sad than angry for most of that trip really mm. um in lots of ways and 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 yes some anger as well but I do feel very strongly, I mean, you know, I've spoken to so many people who've known I've written this and or was writing it and haven't read it, who seem to think that we can just ban cotton growing, for example, and that will be the end of the problem, which is such rubbish. Mm. Um, for a start, I mean, unless you're planning to get rid of irrigation entirely, which I don't mm. think anybody seriously is arguing, cotton is one of the highest values use of the water you can do. It's an immensely profitable crop. Australian mm. cotton growers are more efficient with water than just about any other cotton growers in the world. Yeah. It's not like you'd remove the problem, you'd just export the problem, basically, and at some yeah. cost to us. Yeah. Um, so I, I was resistant to the idea that we should demonise anybody except possibly for the water thieves, and they certainly are straight out water thieves, which of course is criminal. Mm. There's probably some corruption as well among bureaucrats and politicians. Uh, the Independent Commission Against Corruption is investigating at the moment. Obviously, those are the baddies, but you could take them out of the equation and we've still got a massive problem. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to solve the problem if everybody continues just to demonise each other. And the tendency at the moment is for everybody to think, well, I'm using the right amount of water in the right way right here. Those buggers upstream and those buggers downstream, you know, they're either wastrels or thieves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, this, we're just not going to get anywhere if that attitude persists. Yeah. And part of, partly this is the legacy of that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan has been macro policy imposed from Canberra, very largely. Yeah. And a lot of farming communities, including a lot of very impressive people of real goodwill, have had it imposed on them and have felt themselves to be bulldozed, their local knowledge largely ignored. And I think that's a fair criticism. And the, you know, the agencies that are in charge of this whole show from Canberra are, you know, late in the day trying to address that. But the legacy of resentment and um and ill feeling is going to be very hard to overcome i think yeah i can imagine and you're right i didn't want to add to it or not without good reason but if i'd come away with the conclusion that the cotton industry or the almond growing industry or whatever it is was the problem i certainly would have said so yeah. but i just don't think that's right i think it's governments yeah who have allowed people to get away with things mm. powerful and dominant industries like cotton have gotten away with some other with more than others but the problem is really with governments and governance, not with individual farmers or individual crops. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Chrissy, I'm aware of time. Is it? I'm just saying there's a couple of questions coming in now, so I might just ask those, but if we don't have more, I can cut back to you, Anna. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question from Jan, which is, says, Margaret, what sort of impact did the Wentworth Group of Conservatives mm -hmm scientists have on raising issues of river, river health and ecology with policy makers have they survived or who is now arguing on behalf of the river sure now the wentworth group of concerned scientists i think is their full name which was exactly that a bunch of scientists who know a lot about the river were crucial in the early days and they were some of the earliest people arguing for the establishment of the murray darling basin commission they were a key lobby group during the, um, the time that the plan was being negotiated and they still exist, but they are now very critical of the way the plan has actually been implemented. Um, some people will know there was a Royal Commission into the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in South Australia, which ended up being extremely critical. Um, and the Wentworth Group were witnesses before that and gave evidence and they've still got a website which has got more recent reports um which are largely critical but they too i think would say we're better off with the plan than without but that it's not working too well at the moment 
There's another question here from um, Linda Hartnett. Um, mm -hmm. How did small communities like, is it Wilcannia? Yeah. Um, Wilcannia almost run out of water. Don't the state government have a responsibility to provide that water? Oh, well, the, the second half of the question is easy to answer, yes. <laughs> um, so they ran out of water partly because of the drought, um, like everybody on the Darling has very little water at the moment. It's a, a bit better since recent rains, since Christmas. Uh, but when I was there, nobody had any water. I mean, the Darling was just dry for, you know, huge kilometres of its course. But there is a, a bigger story behind that, which is about these huge uh, water storages that have been built um, in northern New South Wales and, and in Queensland. And, you know, they're, they're enormously large dams, really, but they don't look huge because they're just, you know, you're talking about very flat land and you're talking about earthen banks that are just, you know, well, I scrambled up some of them. I committed some trespass, so they're not that big, but they just stretch forever. And, you know, the nature of that country, it's semi-tropical. It either floods or you, you're dry, but on the flood, they will fill those up and then eke them out over the dry. And that's really how the cotton industry runs. But the problem is that we don't know how much is there. Nobody knows, including the Murray Darling Basin Authority, how much is there. What we do know is that it's more, they're keeping more water than was allowed for when the plan was devised. And only just now are state governments getting to grips with trying to find out how much is there and to regulate it. Um, but that is part of the story behind why the Darling has run dry in the lower reaches, which, in, in, which includes Wilcannia. Another thing is, and, and here I am going to get a bit technical, this is the sort of dry language that I was objecting to, but there are things called water resource sharing plans, which are basically the tin tacks of how water is shared catchment by catchment. And one of the most important was the um, Darling, the Barwon Darling water sharing plan, Long story short, it went. It was put out by the New South Wales government for a lengthy period of public comment and consultation. Everybody agreed. And then at the very last minute, a lobbyist called Ian Cole, who is a very powerful figure in Burke, got the fix in with the minister and there were late changes, which basically allowed irrigators to take more water when the river was low. And that too is part of the reason why Wilcannia is dry. Mm. Now, I've spent a fair bit of time in Wilcannia, and it's a very sad story, one of the saddest places in Australia. And those two reasons are also part of the reason, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why the, the Men Menindee The Menindee Lakes, lakes yeah. It's yes, that's, that's also part of the reason why the Menindee Lakes. So Menindee Lakes um, are sort of, if you imagine the Darling going north from um, Mildura and Wentworth, the Menindee Lakes are sort of like beads on the river course um, near the town of Menindee. Well, Kenya is just a bit further upstream. And they are natural, very ancient, uh, shallow lakes, which are at the moment dry. Um, but they've also been used as storages for the irrigation industry. And New South Wales is trying to satisfy some of its obligations under the plan to sort of claw back water by minimising evaporation and that means by make it by pumping water out of those lakes more often, um, running them down more often and that's going to have a huge environmental impact um, but uh, and is immensely controversial certainly with the traditional land um, owners with people from Broken Hill who are used to going boating on those lakes and they are also you know hugely important fish nurseries um, and so the environmental impact of this plan is immense, but the idea is that by having the lakes dry, they can save water or save water through clawing back those evaporation losses, and that means they won't have to claw so much back from irrigators. Sorry, that probably sounds incredibly complicated, and it is. And, um, and the major fish kills yeah. on those lakes yeah. um, was is was. Was they, was it, can we say that that was a result of those clawbacks? Uh, part of the story, the fish kill was a bit upstream of the Menindee Lakes, but certainly the, the fish kills were one of the legacies of the Barwon Darling water sharing plan and less water coming down, and then even longer term, more water from the headwaters of the Darling being retained in these great big storages. So mm. it was a long story which the locals had been 
um, upset about for a very long time and have been completely ignored. I mean, these are tiny little remote towns, you know, towns that in some cases are less than a dozen people, generally speaking, a few hundred. Mm. Um, they're right on the edge of two of the largest rural electorates in New South Wales. Um, until the fish kill, they were hardly ever visited by politicians um, or journalists. Um, and when the fish kill happened, there was this immense community effort to publicise what was happening and to use that as a way of saying, look, this, you know, this isn't just drought, this is also structural unfairness in the way the water is used. Mm. It was largely successful in the sense that they got the attention and they love journalists up there. I mean, you have trouble paying for a beer in the pub if you're a journalist. <laughs> um, but, um, but you know, it's, you wouldn't say that they've won the larger political battle or not yet anyway. No. Mm. A final question from um, Scott who asks, how has the Shooters, Fishers and... Um, oh, where am I? Farmers Party, yeah. ...got traction in water politics and who are sponsoring that party? Yeah, okay. So... Um, Two answers. Um, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, which again most city people seem to think is all about shooting and fishing, is actually not about those things. It's about water. It is fundamentally about water politics. And if you go onto their New South Wales site in particular, you'll see that quite clearly. Their policies about water are front and centre. And yes, there's some stuff about being allowed to hunt and shoot without green and red tape, but it's very much a second order. They have an incredibly sophisticated understanding of water politics and they've used that to the max. Um, and because of perceptions that the National Party has been favouring its cotton grown mates up north, um, there's been a split in the irrigation community between the north and the south. And the south has got behind the, the Shooters and Fishers Party as a way of getting back at the National Party. And the key figure there is a guy called Chris Brooks who's the former CEO of Glencore. I interview him in the essay. He has a property uh, near Tokenwall in New South Wales, and he is really the leader of the Can the Plan uh, protests. He sponsored um, the campaigns of a couple of key MPs in the New South Wales state election who took seats from the National Party. And he was also behind Voices for Farah, which was uh, tried to get rid of Susan Lay, the Liberal Party member, for Farah in the federal election. And he has come, I describe him in the essay as the most effective political lobbyist outside the cities. I don't think there's any arguing with that. And the, he's made the politics for the National Party very, very difficult, which some would say they deserve that because the National Party, I think, have proved themselves not up to the task of managing the river, even though they always get the water portfolios at both state and federal level. But um, because Chris Brooks is basically saying do away with the plan altogether um, and he's pretty contemptuous of the plan's environmental aims, I'm not sure he's a net positive contributor, put it that way. But he's made the politics almost impossible for the National Party, which in some ways is an achievement, I guess. Mm. 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 Look, it has been, this has been the most fascinating conversation and there's more in the essay. The essay has, um, you know, is, is packed full of, of more um, that we could talk about. Um, we are running running short of time, so I thought we might um, just um, pop back to you for some final comments. Is there anything um, that you want people to take away from this essay, Margaret? Um, well, the reason I wrote it is because, uh, of, well, for all the reasons I've said, I think it's a big and important policy problem. It tells us something about our politics and its capacities and incapacities at the moment. I have to say that watching the National Cabinet actually working over the last few weeks in another sort of more immediate crisis has made me wish they could just sort of hang around for a little um, and solve this one too, because there are no National Party politicians in the National Cabinet worth mm. nothing, and they've actually got things done, you know, could they hang around for a couple of weeks rather than have COAG, which gets bogged down and, um, and sort this problem. So, you know, I would encourage people to, um, one of the reasons I wrote the essay is because I hope people learn about this and care about it and educate themselves, but also because even in, you know, urban Australia, this is a story about our nation. Mm. It's a story about you know, the, the physicality of our nation, but also about how our nation does and doesn't work. Mm. And, um, and that's a story worth telling, I think. So I hope people enjoy it. Mm. Thanks very much, though. Thank you so much, Margaret. It was wonderful.
That's okay. Thank you so much for doing it, Anna, and thanks mm -hmm. to um, thanks to Avid for having us. Thank, Thank you, Chrissy and Avid. Both of you, this has been really fascinating. I have shared um, the link, I'm sharing it again, to the book. Um, so if you do want to um, purchase a copy of the book, um, that is the link to go to and we can send it anywhere around Australia or the world that you happen to be. This has been really fantastic having this um, conversation tonight. Thank you all. I'm going to unmute everyone briefly so that they can um, clap and then we'll <laughs> the meeting down. So everyone is about to become a cacophony of unmuteness. Not there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.